Welcome to Mideast Realities. I'm your host, Mark Brzezonski. This week and next, we have rather unusual MER programs. Usually, we invite the most honest and independent experts we can find to discuss the realities of the Middle East situation. We do so because the establishment media, both print and TV, far too often obscure and misrepresent the actual realities of the situation. There are many interest groups and think tanks whose job it is to influence the media away from realities and towards the viewpoints of various governments and what can be termed the post-Cold War military-industrial complex. The Israeli-Jewish lobby's influence in Washington is very well known, of course, and it has never been greater than with the Clinton administration. Consequently, with MER, we try to discuss the actual realities of the Middle East as opposed to what the lobbyists, the government spokesmen, and the arms merchants want you to think is happening. This evening, however, we're at the Adas Israel Synagogue in Washington, D.C., to hear what Moshe Ahrens has to say. Moshe Ahrens, one of Israel's leading politicians from the Likud party, has served as Israel's ambassador to the U.S., as well as both Israeli defense and foreign ministers. One of the myths about Israel is that the two major Israeli parties have very different basic policies. Now, while the two parties do have different styles and origins, and while they do use very different rhetoric, and while they do approach some important issues in different ways, the overall Zionist approach of both Labour and Likud to the Palestinians and to the Middle East in general has far more similarities than differences. It was the Israeli Labour Party, for instance, that began the settlement policies in the occupied territories. Likud then expanded them. It is the Israeli Labour Party which today champions a policy it calls separation between Israelis and Palestinians, an apartheid-type policy also dear to Likud. And it is none other than the Labour Party Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin, who a few years ago served during the last Likud government as the Break Their Bones Defense Minister, while today's Foreign Minister, Shimon Peres, also worked closely with Likud in the past. Indeed, it appears that Likud governance of Israel may be approaching again. By early 1996, if not sooner, Israel will be in the throes of a historic election campaign, and indications are that Likud's Benjamin Netanyahu may well become Prime Minister. So today's talk by Moshe Ahrens before an almost exclusively Jewish audience will no doubt bring insights into what twists and turns to expect if and when the Likud strikes again. Overall, shifting Likud labor governments can be thought of as a kind of good cop, bad cop routine. Indeed, one of Likud's more significant accomplishments is to help portray labor as somehow more reasonable and more moderate, even if basic labor policies usually mirror those of the Likud in actual practice. Remembering these important caveats, still it will be extremely interesting to hear how Moshe Ahrens presents himself tonight. Listen hard and listen skeptically, for most of the significant things Ahrens will say will be vague and between the lines. Even the Likud has learned to portray itself when abroad and when speaking in English very cautiously so as not to offend more liberal American Jewish audiences more liberal than themselves, that is. Indeed, Moshe Ahrens will surely be trying very hard tonight to mask the realities of, the, of today's Middle East. So I'll occasionally try to interject a few correctives of my own as we go. It's a to welcome Ambassador Ahrens, uh, who uh, was at one time not only a member of the community, but was considered a member of this congregation, to welcome him home to all of Israel, uh, to welcome our panelists, and to thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to call on uh, Sarah Lazarus, representing the American Jewish Committee, uh, and thank Jeff Weintraub and the committee for all their efforts in making this evening possible. If you haven't noticed already, there are copies of Mr. Aaron's new book uh, uh, available for sale, um, and uh, uh, the ambassador has agreed to uh, stay on for at least a short while and, and sign some books um, if you'd like to take advantage of, of that opportunity. Um, let me just briefly introduce this extremely distinguished panel, um, and I'll say a few things about them later when, when, uh, when their turn to fire questions at uh, the ambassador comes. We have Josh uh, Goshko of the uh, Washington Post, Barry Schwey of the AP, and Margaret Warner, who is now with the McNeil Air News Hour, uh, all of them extremely experienced and respected uh, uh, journalistic experts on the, on the Middle East. Um, Mr. Ahrens comes to us tonight at a moment when Israel is facing one of its uh, greatest uh, challenges. Um, uh, on the one hand, Israel has never 
never been at uh, peace with as many neighbors as it is today. On the other hand, it is not at peace um, as the spate of suicide bombings and other clashes with violent rejectionists have, have demonstrated. Um, Mr. Ahrens is going to both talk about uh, the uh, matters that are covered in his, in his book uh, concerning his own uh, tenure as a um, uh, member of the, the Kud uh, cabinet in the most recent government. Uh, I'm sure he'll also be wanting to talk about um, the uh, events that we're all concerned about today. Uh, just in case uh, some of you don't know, uh, Ambassador Ahrens has been a leading member of the Likud party since his election to the Knesset in 1974, uh, beginning with his appointment in 1982 as ambassador to the U.S. Uh, he has since taken on a variety of important uh, positions, including defense minister and foreign, foreign minister in the mid-80s and early 90s. He was born in Lithuania, he grew up in Latvia, he immigrated to the U.S. at the outbreak of World War II, um, uh, and then to Israel in 1948. Uh, he has degrees in engineering from MIT and Caltech. Uh, he's been a university lecturer on engineering in Israel. He ran his own engineering firm. He oversaw Israel's major aircraft and weapons systems program programs in his role as vice president for engineering with Israel Aircraft in Industries. Uh, two years ago, uh, Mr. Ahrens resigned from the Knesset, and since then he has served as vice chairman of the Israel Corporation. He's also the author of the just released book, which is what we're here for Broken Covenant, American Foreign Policy, and the Crisis Between the U.S. and Israel. Please join me in welcoming Uh, thank you very much. It is uh, really a pleasure to be uh, with you here tonight. It's almost like homecoming, coming back to uh, Washington after many, many years. I spent a year in, in the city as uh, Israel's ambassador. Uh, I'm always surprised uh, on meeting people who seem to think that I must have been here for four or five, six or seven years. It was only uh, 12 months, but they were a very intense uh, 12 months. It was the period of uh, the war in Lebanon. And uh, those of you whose memory goes back that far will probably recall that during that period I appeared on television here uh, almost every day and sometimes uh, twice or three times a day. And uh, there's a certain element of nostalgia connected with uh, coming back to the city. Uh, in which I spent uh, a memorable year. Uh, as you've heard, as you've heard in the introduction, I've done uh, many things in my life. Uh, I'm probably on my seventh career at this stage, but I had never written a book. This is the first book I've written. I think it's probably the last book I've got to write. <laughs> uh, because I'm busy doing uh, things. Uh, I had never thought that I would end up writing a book, but I wanted to get it out of my system. I thought it was important uh, to tell the story of uh, four years, 1988 to 1992, uh, four years in which I was Israel's foreign minister and Israel's defense minister, uh, years that were very eventful, uh, that are important even now when, when we look back at these years, and there have been many events uh, since then. Uh, the title of the book, uh, as I originally envisaged it, uh, was going to be uh, War and Peace in the Middle East, 1988 to 1992. Uh, that is the title of the book in Hebrew, Milchan Abu Shalom Shalom, 1988 to 1992. But the American publisher wanted a somewhat zappier title, I guess. And <laughs> And that's how this uh, Broken Covenant title uh, got born. The book, uh, as you can uh, judge, uh, is not an autobiography. Uh, I thought that it would divert attention from the story that I felt needed to be told, and probably would not be told by anybody else, and maybe it would have gone untold, unless I wrote this book, if I were to stretch it all the way from 
the time and place where I was born until uh, until the present time. So maybe I'll just say a few words about uh, my biography, the, the pieces and parts that do not appear with any prominence uh, in the book. I went to Israel in 1948 from the United States. Uh, quite frequently people in, in the United States uh, will ask me, how is it that you went to Israel in 1948? And I'm a little hesitant to uh, respond with uh, what naturally comes to my mind. I would say, how is, how is it that you did go to Israel in 1948? <laughs> because to me, at that time, it seemed like uh, the only thing to do. An obligation that I, as a young Jew at the time, felt I had. Uh, I had the feeling at the time, and I think correctly so, in a historical perspective, that uh, the Jewish people, three years after the full dimensions of the Holocaust had become apparent, uh, were fighting for their lives that maybe this was really our last battle uh, for survival. And I thought every Jew that could contribute in any manner or measure to uh, victory in that battle had to, uh, had to, had to do his part. I uh, afterwards returned to my profession. I was an aeronautical engineer. I, I taught at the Technion uh, in the Department of Aeronautical Engineering that was founded at the time under the inspiration of uh, David Ben-Gurion, who was uh, Prime Minister and Defense Minister at the time. I never dreamt in my wildest dreams that I would ever end up being Israel's Defense Minister and uh, hold the office that, uh, that he held. It was a great period for me, uh, teaching at the Technion, then going on to become the Chief Engineer of Israel Aircraft Industries, which was no more than a garage when I first started there in 1982 that did minor modifications of aircraft and that uh, within a number of years uh, became one of the great aerospace industries of the world, uh, created, developed uh, by these graduate, these young graduates of the Department of Aeronautical Engineering uh, of the Technion. And uh, it was only after I left Israel Aircraft Industries in uh, 1971 that I went into business, had a little more time, a little more money, and then a moment of weakness uh, allowed myself to be talked into going to politics and uh, running for the Knesset thinking that maybe I would contribute four years or part of my time during four years on the political scene, do what I could for, for my country as a politician, but the four years stretched out to be 18 years and the last four years of those 18 years are recorded in, in the book that uh, you have before you. Uh, there were, I think, important, important years in Israel's history. And they included uh, four specific developments, events, if you like. One, the Intifada. I inherited the Intifada from uh, my predecessor at the Ministry of Defense, uh, Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, we changed posts twice, a very unusual occurrence uh, anywhere and unprecedented in Israel. Uh, he took over the defense ministry from me in 1984, after my first 10 years as defense minister, and then again in 1992 after uh, Labour won the elections and uh, I turned the defense minister over, uh, over to him. Intifada broke out during the time that he was defense minister. Uh, when I became foreign minister after the Likud election victory in uh, 1988, it was going strong. Uh, it was causing Israel a great deal of damage. Uh, Rabin used to say, and, and I, uh, I agreed and repeated that, that it was not endangering the very existence of the state of Israel. It wasn't like the Yom Kippur War. But uh, we knew that it had the seeds of causing Israel a great deal of damage, which in the long run might uh, create dangers that maybe we couldn't even fully conceive. But when I entered the foreign ministry, I realized that uh, Israel was becoming increasingly isolated, uh, coming under uh, attack and pressure 
not only from those who have never been friends of Israel, but also from friends of Israel, uh, from members of the Jewish community. Uh, there was considerable concern and dissension in Israel itself, uh, and it was a phenomenon that had to be addressed. I point out in the book that I think it, uh, it was a very grave mistake on the part of Israeli governments, mostly labor, but uh, eventually also we could, that over the years since 1967, when uh, Judea, Samaria, and Gaza came under Israeli control, uh, the Palestinian population was in effect ignored. There was no Israeli policy towards uh, the Palestinian problem. It was a non-policy. Uh, it was a policy, a non-policy that was originally enunciated by Moshe Dayan, who was defense minister during the Six-Day War and for many years uh, thereafter, which in effect said that Israel was waiting for a telephone call from Tim Hussein. Uh, there was some specious logic in, in the saying, uh, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, had been annexed by Jordan in 1948 after Jordan participated in the attack on, uh, on Israel in 1948. The uh, Palestinian population, in those days it was called the Arab population of the area, had received Jordanian citizenship. And so Dayan said, and uh, that policy was then followed by uh, successive Israeli governments, when and if King Hussein came to the peace table, that would be the time to address and negotiate the status of the territories and of the people living in the territories. But uh, the gap between King Hussein and, and, and Jordan and the Palestinian population became increasingly wide over the years, uh, and uh, the feeling of frustration that their problems, their aspirations were not being addressed, the uh, very difficult economic situation that prevailed in these areas, especially in Gaza, uh, certainly in retrospect we can say inevitably brought about the massive civil disturbances that characterized the Intifada. Uh, I had to deal with that directly when I became defense minister after the National Unity government broke up in uh, uh, 1990 when I took over from Yitzhak Rabin. <coughs> and uh, I'm a little hesitant uh, in, in uh, giving myself compliments, but in effect the Intifada was uh, almost finished by the time of the elections of 1992. <clears throat> there were no more massive disturbances. Uh, there was hardly any more publicity given to the Intifada. You saw, didn't see it on the television screens anymore. It had run out of steam, mainly because it had been a period of, of great suffering and great difficulty for the, uh, for the Palestinian population, but also because we had, uh, I think, sent a clear message to them that Israel was not going to give in to violence and that nothing was going to be achieved by rock throwing. And by the time I left the Defense Ministry in 1982, 1992, we had essentially restored normal life to the territories. I had opened all of the schools, all of the universities. Uh, the PLO, in effect, was in many ways uh, finished, run out of steam, and that that I suppose is the explanation, and that is the explanation given by many for the reason that Arafat was ready to make the agreement with Yitzhak Rabin when the Rabin government uh, indicated its, its readiness to make an agreement with the PLO. They didn't seem to have any alternative anymore. But a new life was, was being breathed into them at a moment when uh, they were essentially finished. <coughs> As foreign minister, I authored the Israeli Peace Initiative of May 1989 in May 1989, it was adopted by the National Union government, in which Paris and Rabin uh, were uh, members. And I uh, did my level best to get this initiative formulated and adopted by the Israeli government because I was convinced, as I came to the foreign ministry, that it was essential for Israel to take an initiative uh, and to show that we were not just stonewalling and, and not just uh, uh, resigning ourselves to the status quo, but that we were interested in moving uh, the diplomatic process along, uh, in proving to the world that if no progress was made, if no progress were to be made, it would not be because of lack of trying on our part. Uh, the peace initiative included uh, four points specifically, 
you'll find in the book that I originally suggested five points, but to have been uh, vetoed one of them. He was defense minister at the time. And the four points were, uh, one, a uh, uh, reconfirmation re of the uh, Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty, uh, the consultations between Israel and Egypt and the United States, uh, which was a signatory to the Camp David Accords, uh, two, the direct negotiations between Israel and those are countries that insisted that they were in a state of war with Israel. Uh, three, negotiations between Israel and democratically elected representatives of the Palestinian population in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. And four, an international effort to uh, relieve the uh, plight of the Palestinian refugees in the refugee camps. Uh, some of those points uh, are in the process of implementation. Uh, the initiative led eventually, after the Gulf War, to the Madrid Conference. The Madrid Conference led to direct negotiations between Israel and Palestinians, Israel and Jordanians, Israel and Syrians, Israel and Lebanese. Not all these negotiations have uh, produced uh, concrete results, at least uh, not so far. Uh, elections amongst the Palestinian population were never held. I think that that was a very bad mistake. And the negotiations that eventually brought about an agreement, which in my view is, is, a, is a sad mistake, were uh, held with Yasser Arafat and the PLO, and not with the people that were elected by, or had a mandate from the population living, living in the area. Uh, the third major event during the four-year period was the Gulf War. Uh, a six-week war for Israel, a very unusual and in some ways traumatic war uh, for Israel. Again, Israel's existence was never really in danger, although we were not quite sure of that uh, at certain periods. We knew that uh, Saddam Hussein had chemical weapons. We knew that he had missiles that hit Israel, and Iraqi missiles did hit Israel. Thirty-nine of them uh, landed in Israel. Uh, we had to do something that had not been done anywhere in the world since World War II. I, as defense minister, issue gas masks to every man, woman, child, and baby in Israel in anticipation that we might be hit by uh, uh, Scud missiles with uh, chemical warheads. And uh, we found that even though it was no accident that Saddam Hussein, who was a sworn enemy of Israel and threatened Israel with destruction and threatened, threatened Israel with the use of chemical warfare, but for a certain period of time, in my view, an aberration, was supported by uh, the administration in Washington, was given, amongst other things, what the administration refused to give to Shamir's government, namely loan guarantees, which were not used for their uh, presumed purpose of buying agricultural uh, produce, but rather were used for, uh, for weaponry. Uh, it was no accident that this man who was an enemy of Israel also turned out to be an enemy of the United States. I think that that was inevitable. But as it turned out, and, and I wrote about it in the book, the enemy of our enemy did not turn out to be our friend. And uh, uh, the Israeli-U.S. relationship during that period as well, or maybe especially during that period, was not really the kind of relationship that you would expect uh, to uh, have occur between two allies at war against a common enemy. Uh, the four-year period uh, in terms of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, which is really one uh, very unique between two countries very far apart, in many ways very different. Israel, one of the smallest countries in the world, the United States, uh, the superpower today, the leader of the democratic community of nations.